let's think about all the positives. It's basically spring. The US is vaccinating 3 million people a day. Uh, that's the end of the list of positive things, but those are two very positive things. Hey everyone, I'm Claire, I'm in my home kitchen. Today I'm showing you a recipe from Dessert Person, the only one in the book that is not actually baked. It's my English muffins, and I'm gonna show you how to get those really classic nooks and crannies. It's really fun to make. I love English muffins. Well, do I love English muffins? I love a breakfast sandwich on an English muffin. So I think that I made this recipe as a means of making the most delicious breakfast sandwich possible, which I'm gonna make. And it's really satisfying when you look at a homemade English muffin and it looks just like the kind out of the package, but it tastes 10 times better. Do you know the origin of the English muffin? Do you? Absolutely. You really? Mm -hmm. This is like a thing people know? For sure. What is the origin of the English muffin? Guess. It's from England. Wrong. <laughs> I don't know how English muffins became a thing, but I did look to English crumpets, an actual English thing, as sort of a jumping off point for this recipe because I'd made English muffins in the past from a pretty firm dough and they looked great, but they didn't have the nooks and crannies. So I am borrowing from crumpet making technique and using a super wet dough that gives you those lots of nooks and crannies. This recipe does need a stand mixer. You could sit there, make it by hand with a wooden spoon, but you would be stirring for a long time because it's such a wet batter. It's much, much easier in a stand mixer with the dough hook. So I have that right here. In terms of ingredient list, it's really simple stuff and very straightforward. I have some bread flour, kosher salt, a little bit of butter, active dry yeast, two tablespoons honey, a little bit of whole wheat flour, which is optional, but recommended, milk and cornmeal for dusting. Oh, and vegetable oil, which is not really an ingredient in the English muffins, but you need to keep everything well greased and not sticky. So the first step in the recipe is to do something called scalding the milk. Scalding means I'm going to bring it up to a temperature just under boiling. And basically the milk will get to the point where I'll start to see little tiny bubbles collecting around the sides of the pot. The surface will have a little bit of a skin on top and that's where I am at that temperature right below boiling. I'm gonna hold it there for 30 seconds, a minute, and turn it off and then I have scalded milk. And I guess in the meantime, I can put my dry ingredients inside my mixing bowl. Put it there. So I'm using bread flour. Bread flour has a higher protein content. The higher protein content means that when I mix the dough, it will produce more gluten. Then I add about a quarter cup of whole wheat flour. I'm just really adding it because I like the flavor. Two teaspoons kosher salt. I'm using Diamond. If you're using Morton at home, which is the other widely available brand, use half that amount. One teaspoon active dry yeast. I'm gonna go through the motions of proofing the yeast, but I made a version of this dough last night. And I've used this jar of yeast, I know it's good. I didn't bother with proofing, I just added everything to the mixing bowl and got it going. So this step is optional if you're confident that your yeast is alive and well. I'm going to use some of the warm milk to proof the yeast. So I'm gonna take this off the heat. It's just been sitting here right at that, just below boiling temperature for about a minute. I'm gonna turn it off. Okay, so you can see there's like a little skin on the surface. So when I jiggle it, there's like little tiny wrinkles that are forming on the surface as the milk underneath the skin moves around. That's off the heat. I'm gonna whisk in butter. I have two tablespoons. And my honey. So whisk that together. Now this is the part of the recipe that requires a little bit of patience because I want this mixture to cool down. But if I were to use it at this temperature, which is close to boiling, it's probably around like 190 degrees or so, it would kill the yeast. So I need this to cool down to more of like a lukewarm, tepid temperature. And so you can just leave it at room temp, go do something, you know, fold some laundry or whatever, come back, or you can do what I'm gonna do because we're on the clock today. Uh, and I'm going to stir it over a little bit of an ice bath. So. If you're not using a thermometer, basically what you want to do is go by touch. 
If body temp is around 98.6, you want something that feels just slightly, slightly warm. This should cool down quickly. So I'm at around 100, which is maybe even like slightly cooler than I wanted, but oh well. So I'm gonna grab a tablespoon measure and two tablespoons of the warm milk mixture to dissolve the yeast. Sorry. With active dry yeast, there are yeast particles that are coated in this kind of dehydrated shell and they're like little tiny granules and so you just wanna dissolve the coating and that will help to activate the yeast. So that's why I'm whisking. So let that sit for a few minutes and then I'll put together the dough in the stand mixer. How's Felix? Okay, well, I, oh God. Felix is great, you guys, Felix is fine. I do think he's possibly developed a chronic form of pancreatitis because we just he was having the same symptoms and we took him back to the vet and she was like, he's okay, but he's not that young anymore. If he looks isn't a kitten. He's he's fine, guys. Thank you for asking. Archie couldn't be happier. Archie, I think every day is just glad that he's not like still living in the woods. And Maya is living her best life. Maya is having the best time ever. So all the cats are good. My yeast is activated. If I let it sit longer, I know it would get super puffy and you'd see like little balloons of yeast activity, but I'm gonna move on. I have all my dry ingredients in the bowl. I'm gonna pour in the scalded milk mixture, which has now basically cooled, and the yeast mixture. So I'm turning this on. And the dough hook is gonna do everything. It's gonna bring it together. So this has to go for quite a bit longer, but I just want to take a chance now to scrape it down and make sure that there isn't any trapped flour at the bottom of the bowl. Whenever you have a wet dough like that, this tool called a bowl scraper is really, really convenient. These, these cost literally $1. It's a good investment. So I'm gonna let this go for, at this point, maybe six minutes, eight to 10 minutes total. In the meantime, I'm gonna take my bowl and I'm gonna generously oil it. This is just vegetable oil. So I drizzled it. I'm gonna just sort of rub it around with my fingers. So I'm oiling it because I don't want the dough to stick to the sides. And as with most recipes made with active dry yeast, we do two rises. The first is gonna happen in this bowl. Then we sort of flatten it out and then it goes into the fridge for a second slow rise overnight. This looks great. So the dough is Mostly pulling away from the sides and gathered up the hook. It looks like a dough, but when I stop the mixer, we'll immediately kind of settle back down. So again, a really, really wet dough, but that is how you get some of those big air bubbles that produce our nooks and crannies, which is the hallmark of a good English muffin. So I'm gonna scrape this down, get rid of this hook. Okay, so here's what the dough looks like. Still quite sticky, but it has enough structure to sort of hold its shape somewhat. And now this will go into our greased bowl for its first rise. Okay, so scrape every last bit into that bowl. You wanna make sure that the dough is not stuck to the bowl anywhere. It should kind of be able to move around the bowl without any anchor points. So basically when you do this, you shake the bowl, it should move freely. See how it's not sticking anywhere? So now this is gonna rise. I'm gonna cover it and that yeast will produce gas. The whole thing will double in volume and you'll be able to see visibly that the dough has lots of big air bubbles in it. So I'm gonna cover this, put it in a room temperature or slightly warm spot and this will rise. While that's rising, I am going to prepare a baking sheet and this is how I'm going to refrigerate the dough overnight after its first rise. So I have a baking sheet. This is a half sheet. Use whatever rim baking sheet you've got, a piece of parchment paper. I am going to generously oil the parchment. Very wet dough like this does have a tendency to stick. So I'm oiling it. And then one of the very classic things that you see with English muffins is a cornmeal dusting. So here I have some, this is like a medium ground cornmeal. 
it doesn't matter what you use, you can use whatever you've got. And give the entire piece of parchment paper a generous dust. This mostly prevents sticking, but it also gives a little crunch and also a really classic look. So that goes on one side. And then I have just another piece of parchment paper right here. Now this gets laid down on top of the dough. And again, to prevent sticking, I just want to oil this piece of parchment. That's it, and now we're just waiting for the dough to rise. This has been going for a couple of hours, but the dough has risen and doubled in size. I recommend you use a slightly smaller bowl than I did because in a smaller bowl, it's easier to gauge uh, the growth of the dough. But you can see that it has not only expanded in volume, but if you look closely, the surface has all sorts of little air bubbles that, that are visible. Okay, so I took the bowl scraper and I just went around the sides of the dough to loosen it. And now I'm gonna basically let it kind of gently fall onto the baking sheet like so. I wanna pat this down into a single even layer and I'm going for something about a half inch thick. So I'm using my hands and the dough which is oiled, but if you feel like the dough is a little bit sticky, you could put that parchment on top, oiled side down and use the parchment to help smooth it out. So this is kind of an easy, clean way of working to press the dough out. And now at this point, I wanna cover the baking sheet. So I like to grab, I got these great um, sheet tray covers. So go ahead and slap a cover on it, piece of plastic, whatever. You want something airtight. And now this will go into the fridge and I will chill this for about 12 hours and while it's in the fridge, the dough will kind of relax and also firm up and also puff up slightly. This is a great opportunity for you to set it up the night before and then in the morning, all you have to do is come in, punch out your English muffins and griddle them. I have one area where this will fit. Okay. I love my new sheet tray covers because means I don't have to use plastic. And one of my goals for this year is not to use any single use plastic in my kitchen. Whatever shape your slab is in, you are going to cut out your English muffins. One thing I'll do is sort of plan out like how I'm gonna punch, leaving a little tiny outline. Also, you wanna do this straight from the fridge. The dough is much, much easier to handle when it's cold. So don't pull it out and let it come up to room temp. One, it'll be harder to handle, and two, it might overproof. You wanna press down firmly with the cutter, straight down until you hit the baking sheet, then give it a twist. And as I cut, I'm going to one by one move them from the baking sheet to my griddle. Griddle, I'm using a skillet, whatever. You don't actually need to have a griddle. Hold on, I'm, kind of, I'm not really nailing this, okay. So the griddle, I don't have, my, my skillet is not on. It's cold, which is fine. Can you use like a heart cutter or a Ooh, tree cutter? That's cutter? fun. I never thought about using a cookie cutter for the shapes, which is really fun, especially if you have kids. I don't see why not. I would just not use a very intricately patterned cutter. So like a snowman would be a great one or a star, I guess. Um, but yeah, try it, but just make sure it's well oiled. Okay, so here like I took some scraps and I just patting them together. I have all my English muffins cut out. Half of them are already in the skillet. I'm gonna stick these back in the fridge um, just cause it'll make it easier for transferring them to the skillet from the baking sheet. You don't have to cover them. They won't be in there that long. So it's time to start cooking these. I'm gonna turn my heat on and I'm gonna cook them on low. A lot of recipes tell you to start on the stove top in a skillet or a griddle and then you transfer them to the oven to finish cooking. I didn't really feel like doing that. I felt like it was so many moving parts. So I want, I wanted the recipe to be made entirely on the stove top. It just felt easier, a little more streamlined. And so in order to ensure that the center of the muffin fully cooks, we cook them very, very slowly. And this also gives those air bubbles inside an opportunity to kind of slowly expand as the dough sets. The skillet is dry. I didn't add any additional grease. There is already a little bit of oil on the dough and then of course the cornmeal, so they don't stick at all. 
Um, so I'm going to very slowly cook these on the first side until the center is done, the bottom is golden brown, and then I'll turn them over and the second side goes much faster. They go on this first side like five to seven minutes. So just try to be patient, let them sit there. One thing I wanna do is to like rotate the pan a little bit every couple minutes because even a cast iron skillet will get hot spots and that means uneven browning. So you can rotate the skillet, but don't touch the muffins. They do not want to be touched at this point. I looked at the clock before I started and then I forgot what time it was. So now I don't know how long they've been going. But I know that they are about ready to flip because several things. One, I can smell them. They smell yeasty and delicious. Two, the surface has gone from kind of shiny to more matte. And that's how I know. It's just like you're making pancakes. Same thing when you're making pancakes, you'll see that change in the surface. So I can even sort of touch them without sticking. And of course they've puffed. So I'm gonna go ahead and start to flip them. I suck at flipping things. I don't know why I have like a thing where I can't do it. So this is gonna be a little dicey. Oh God, uh, I'm nervous. Okay, wish me luck. Okay. Not terrible. So this is the first side, which is always the flat side, because what happens is they go into the griddle, they make a lot of contact with the pan, and then as they cook, they puff, and so the second side becomes more rounded. They mostly cook through on the first side, and now that I flip them, I just wanna put some color on the second side. So now I'm up to like medium low. They need to cool and have some steam escape so they don't end up gummy in the middle. They feel light for their size, so that's another good indication that there are lots of nooks and crannies inside. Second side, a little more rounded. First side with cornmeal, nice and brown. I really like this one. I like the height that it gets. I like how nice and golden brown both sides are. Now let's talk about how you open an English muffin. You do not slice. We're not gonna cut these. You fork them open, and I'll show you how to do that, because that's how you expose the nooks and crannies. I don't want a smooth cut through. So I like to poke the tines of the fork in that midline all the way around. Hi, Maya. And I should point out that this is warm, not hot. This is cooled for probably 10 minutes or so. And now, I'm gonna open it up. We have here the classic nook and cranny texture of an English muffin. You can see there's a nook, there's a cranny, there's a nook. There's a cranny. You can see all sorts of different size air bubbles. And also the center is cooked. It's not like a doughy mess. I don't know what the difference between a nook and a cranny is. Maybe they're, maybe it's the same. Maybe you, it's a nook and a cranny, I don't know. So I was doing a recipe test a while ago and I made these candied kumquats which is sort of like a jam. I'm gonna give this a little taste first. Mm. Mm. Very kumquatty and delicious. And now the breakfast sandwich. I'm not gonna taste it. I know what it tastes like. I'm gonna leave it for you guys. I'll cut it in half and show you. I guess what I like about this recipe besides having that end result is that there's a lot of great learning here. There's a scalding the milk trick. There's making a really wet batter dough kind of thing to create nooks and crannies, but ultimately it's really easy and, and super forgiving. And then at the end you have this really fun, almost like a novelty, but it's super delicious and very versatile. So I think you should try it. It's really fun. You can set the whole thing up the night before. There's gonna be a lot more dessert person to come. We're definitely gonna try to mix it up a little bit. I always love showing you recipes from the book, but there's a lot of other stuff that we're gonna do and play around with. So thank you for watching. Tune in again and like and subscribe. Thank you.